about an hour. Oh, okay. My baby dolls, we're back again. Another episode of Genesis. How are you? We are uh, here, and we're going to be talking about some uh, Casey Stengel. We have a great show lined up with you. We have uh, Marty Appel, who was the Yankees PR for the longest of time. Uh, back in the 1970s uh, here, and uh, we'll get to the book, and we'll get to Marty in a second, uh, but you are listening to my show, Genesis, on uh, the Comfortably Zone Radio Network with the zigzag man, Ralph Tycho himself, and um, this is looking to be uh, one of the great shows, because I love Casey Stengel, and we're going to sit down with Marty Appel, and if you don't know who Marty Appel is, he was the youngest public relations director in baseball history. When Mr. George Steinbrenner elevated him to the New York Yankee Post in 1973, he is the author of, and the co-author of numerous books, including the New York Times best-selling Munson, The Life and Death of a Yankee Captain, and Pinstripe Empire, The New York Yankee from Before the Babe and After the Boss, and uh, that's probably the definitive book uh, if you want to get a great book history. He resides in New York City. And without any further ado, welcome to the show, Marty. Thank you. Good to be on with you. Good to talk a little baseball. No, oh, it's a uh, it's, uh, – why do you – why was it time, Marty? Uh, because I know it says in your intro, and I knew you were friends uh, with the late uh, Robert I know we're doing this on tape, but I have to say your voice keeps breaking up, so I'm not hearing the full comment. I'm hearing like every other word. Do you oh, want to start right, over? Uh, sure, sure, sure. How's this? Yeah, sometimes it gets a little tricky here on um, this thing. Why was it time to revisit Casey, um, Marty? Uh, you know, Robin Crema. Uh, wrote the book in 84 on uh, on Casey. Why do you think it was time uh, to uh, give new light to Casey? In uh, 2009, when MLB Network was born, I think that was the year, but they did a lot of superlatives. They did, like, best baseball movie, best relief pitcher, things like that. And they did baseball's greatest character, and they named Casey Stengel. They named him ahead of Yogi and Babe and Dizzy and Satchel, everybody. So that kind of opened my eyes to um, an interest in Casey. And at the same time, my editor at Doubleday saw the same thing. So he actually suggested a book, and my first reaction was, gosh, Bob Kramer's book was so good. But we talked about it, and we realized it was over three decades ago. Maybe it was time for a fresh look. And so we went ahead with it, and we decided to do that even before I stumbled on things that Bob Kramer didn't have access to, the Internet being one of them. That let me look at the archives of uh, newspapers from when Casey was a young man playing minor league baseball. So a lot of long-lost anecdotes emerged from that. And then when the Stengel family heard I was doing this, they made available to me an unpublished memoir by Edna Stengel, Casey's wife, which revealed a whole different side of Casey and was a joy to include in the book. And it was something that Bob Kramer didn't have access to. So uh, very lucky to find that, and that was enough material to make the whole project worthwhile. Now, what did you find in uh, Edna's diary that sheds more light um, on this, on, on Casey's personal uh, history that pretty much no one knew before? Well, we only knew Casey the baseball guy, and now we had a look at Casey the husband, the suitor, the uh, <clears throat> the man who traveled the country for so many years as a manager with Edna by his side. So um, that was a wonderful discovery. He wasn't much of a romantic. In fact, uh, he never really asked Edna to marry him. They were walking down the street, and he just said, so, you think I should convert to Catholic or what? <laughs> that was the proposal. <laughs> that, was, that, that was funny again, because, you know, um, 
um, Edlin had never had children. And you mentioned in the book, um, I think, that, um, you know, Casey thought he was going to be on the road most of the time and, and there would be no time. But did you find anything else uh, in your research on why Casey and Edna uh, never had children? I think it was just that they were both in their 30s when they married. And in those days, people in their 30s really weren't having children. So it may have been no more complicated than that. And then let me ask you this. He, he grew up in um, Kansas City, uh, Casey. And, and then, you know, I love your, I love your portrayal of, uh, of Casey. I think his father um, was up. Uh, he we used to water the streets and stuff like that uh, uh, when, uh, when Casey was young. How did Kansas City help shape uh, Casey's personality and his uh, love for baseball? Well, one thing I discovered to my delight, because I'm a kind of a student of 19th century baseball, was that his neighbor was Kid Nichols, who not too many people would recognize the name today, but he was a 300-game winner in the 19th century. He's a Hall of Famer, and uh, he sort of mentored Casey with advice more than playing tips about listening to your managers and don't get into trouble, because Casey was kind of a smart aleck even as a student and he needed somebody to tell him to follow discipline and not get into arguments with your coaches and your managers. So Kid Nichols was an early mentor. Uh, Casey went to Central High School in Kansas City where he played all sports, preferred that to the classroom. He was never going to be student of the month and um, developed his early baseball skills there. Um, he was also a bit of a rascal as a kid. Uh, he and his brother Grant, they used to like to throw snowballs at men with pipes, try to knock the pipes out of their mouth. <laughs> so <laughs> this was an early adventure for Casey on the way to being Casey. And uh, what's interesting, which I didn't know, uh, he was going to be, he was uh, going to study dentistry. Yeah, this is a bizarre story. Um his parents wanted him to have a fallback profession. He had some friends who went to uh, dental college in Kansas City, and even though he didn't graduate high school, he had enough credits to uh, enroll in Western Dental College in Kansas City. So the intriguing part of it is he went for three semesters uh, during his off-season from playing minor league ball. And after the third semester... It was decided it was not a profession for him because he was left-handed, and equipment for left-handed dentists was very hard to come by. So my question, which I pose in the book, is what took them three semesters to figure this out? <laughs> you would have thought <laughs> on the first day they would have addressed this. <laughs> that's, but, that's, um, that's... Yeah, but so he was always remembered for – having almost been a dentist, and he did get to pull somebody's tooth in dental school once. And, um, you know, you, you, you have a chapter here, and I, I love this chapter because uh, it's so it's such a, um, a relevance to what Casey would become. It's called Lunatic Beginning. And <laughs> why don't we talk to him? I loved it. I loved it. I loved every minute of it, Marty. Yeah, tell me well, what's about uh, one of those things. Yeah, he broke in uh, with a team in Kankakee, Illinois. And um, <laughs> they were called officially the Kankakee K's. But the newspapers referred to them as the lunatics, so politically incorrect today. But the ballpark was located directly across the street from an asylum for the insane. So the newspapers couldn't help themselves. They called the team the lunatics. And, of course, I couldn't help myself by saying Casey started his baseball career as a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think, I think, um, I think Aurora, Illinois, um, was one of the places that, um, Casey was in. What was going on in Aurora, Illinois at the time that uh, made this a popular well, spot? Aurora was a, an important stop for him. It was within train distance a few hours from Chicago. Uh, Casey was having a very good season in 1912 playing at Aurora. 
And so the Brooklyn Dodgers had a scout named Larry Sutton who was always looking for ball games to see prospects and maybe sign somebody good. So he just took the train a couple of stops out to Aurora to catch that team in action. Now, Brooklyn had a player named Zach Wheat who's in the Hall of Fame and who's also from Kansas City. So he knew of Casey Stengel, who was Dutch Stengel back then, and he suggested to Larry Sutton, you check out this Dutch Stengel guy. So the fact that it was such an easy train trip really was an important factor in, in Casey's discovery because Larry Sutton went out there, saw Casey play, and he said in his scouting report that Stengel has blonde hair and blue eyes and those guys are always fighters. That was his assessment. So uh, sure enough, he offered Casey a contract, and by the end of the year, by the end of 1912, Casey was wearing a Brooklyn uniform and was in the big leagues without ever, having ever played at the highest level of minor league ball. And I think it was 1913 uh, uh, when Ebbets Field um, was put up in uh, I want to tell people what Casey's uh, salary was when he broke in with the Dodgers. Um, you know what? You, you're fresher with the tale than I am, having written uh, 25,000 facts. I'm not going to be able to remember <laughs> all of them. How about, how about this? How about this, Marty? $4,000. Well, that's, <laughs> and that two- sounds right. That sounds like a, a couple of pitches that today's hitters would receive and get four thousand dollars for those two pitches <laughs> um, yeah, and two dollars and two dollars and fifty cents for meals as well yeah that part i remember that wouldn't go very far um he played it should be noted in 1913 uh i mean in 1912 in the final games in washington park before ebbets field opened in fact, he played in the last game in Washington Park, and he played against Honus Wagner and uh, uh, Fred Clark and, you know, some really impressive Hall of Fame names with the Pirates, Wagner being tops among them. So he got to close that ballpark. He got to open Ebbets Field, and he hit the first home run ever in Ebbets Field. Yeah, and um, you know, Casey was one of those guys where, you know, it's like – it's such a paradox, you know, he looked old, although he was young, you know. How was his relationship with the Dodgers and Uncle Robbie? He was never really sure that Wilbur Robinson, also known as Uncle Robbie, liked him very much. He suffered some signs of depression over the uncertainty of Uncle Robbie's affection for him. Uh, nevertheless, he found his major league sea legs playing for Brooklyn, uh, that was a Hall of Fame manager he broke in with. And while it wasn't an especially good team, he was actually part of the team that went to the World Series in 1916 to play Babe Ruth and the Boston Red Sox. So a little baseball history crossed Casey's path in 1916. And, you know, something during his stay here, we have a great chapter. And I remember this from folklore and from uh from history, the grapefruit from the sky. Yeah, that's a crazy story. It was a stunt. Uh, it had been done once before with a ball dropped from the Washington Monument that Gabby Street of the Washington Senators caught. And, you know, you, to appreciate the story, you have to understand a little bit of physics and how the speed that these objects would pick up falling from such heights. Anyway, in spring training of this year, particular year, it was decided as a stunt that an, a plane would fly over Daytona Beach and drop a baseball, which would be caught by a Brooklyn Dodger. And Casey was either the creator of the idea or an active participant in it. But in any case, as bizarre as the story went, Somehow they forgot to bring a baseball up on the plane. It was a female aviator named Ruth Law. And um, she dropped the, the substitute baseball, which was a grapefruit that she did happen to have on because it was going to be lunch. And the speed and the uh, the 
dynamic of the grapefruit falling it was caught by Wilbur Robinson, who was an older man at this point, and the ball hit him in the chest, and he screamed, oh, I'm dead, I'm dead, which <laughs> is not something you hear every day. <laughs> <laughs> Whether Casey was on the plane or not, and it appears not, but he, uh, the, the story always followed him as being one of the perpetrators of it, and I suspect he was. And let me ask you this, you know, Casey would be, um, you know, long, long throughout his career uh, with pranks and, and good times. Um, you know, the a hot uh, thing that happened at the Abbott Still. Why don't you explain what's going on with that? Because I know he recreates it about 50 years later. Uh, this, you asked about the Sparrow? Because, again, we had some break yeah. up you're in there. Yeah. Okay. Yep. The sound. He gets traded from Brooklyn to uh, Pittsburgh, and when Pittsburgh comes back to Brooklyn, now he's an enemy player. So the fans are booing him, although they had once loved him in Brooklyn. Anyway, uh, as the game progresses uh, and the booing continues, he proceeds to pick up a sparrow uh, in the outfield, tucks it under his hat. And when he comes back to the dugout at the end of the inning, he doffs his cap and the sparrow flies out, which was clearly his way of giving those fans in Ebbets Field the bird. So it went over great. The fans loved it. They decided he's not an enemy after all. He's our Casey. And they cheered him, and they cheered him forever after whenever he came back to Ebbets Field. And let me ask you, so he goes to the Pirates, he goes to Philadelphia, and then I think he goes to Tom McGraw and the Giants. Now, I think, from doing my own observations and being a go up, um, this is where Casey learns the most from John McGraw. Again, I'm terribly sorry that every other oh. word was broken up in there. This is just not working out well. Uh, tell me again, I heard you ask something about okay. McGraw. Yeah, um, this is where Casey, I think, learns, uh, the, uh, really learns from John McGraw, which he's going to take with him for the rest of his life. Yeah, uh, McGraw, as Wilbur Robinson had been, was a Hall of Fame manager of the future, but McGraw really was head and shoulders above Roberts, Robinson. And Casey would sit by his side. He was now an aging ball player and learn so much. He would admire some fielding defensive gem, and McGraw would proceed to tell him why it wasn't a gem at all, why it was actually a dumb play. And Casey's eyes would widen, and he would realize how much he could learn about the game that he didn't know from John McGraw. So one could say that once Casey launched his managing career, McGraw was clearly his mentor. Now, McGraw thought Casey was a smart aleck. He wasn't always that fond of his stunts and his personality. But they actually liked each other socially. And after Casey married, the McGraws and the Stengels were actually very good friends and spent a lot of time at the McGraw home up in Westchester County. But as a player on his team, McGraw found Casey to be more burdensome than he might have been worth. Hello? Yep. Now let me ask you this. Uh, let me ask you this. I'm breaking up a little bit. It's about. breaking up again. I'm not hearing you clearly. I'll ta I tell you what. Let's call back in. Let's shut this down and call back in. And let's see how that's going to work. How's that, Marty? All right. All right. Now let me ask you with McGraw. Um, you know, because... Uh, McGraw was one of those managers that I know you're a lover of 19th century ball. His whole style was the dead ball era. Now, let me ask you this. Did Casey take that whole knowledge and apply it later on when he managed the uh, Boston Bees, uh, the um, – the Well, he took the style, but it, you still need good players to execute the plays. And he was not blessed with good players at either Brooklyn or Boston. 
Um, still, there were elements of McGraw that always stayed with him, um, particularly platooning, which he finally made successful and famous when he managed the Yankees. But he himself was a participant in the platoon system. Managers always knew that <clears throat> lefties and righties had certain advantages and disadvantages against each other. It wasn't as one day that was discovered. So um, Casey would uh, borrow that knowledge from McGraw, remember it, and when he had the talent to actually move people in and out of the lineup to his advantage, that's when the McGraw system really took hold. You know, and a lot of people don't realize, and and this is paradoxical because Casey, I think, was the first one to hit a home run in the uh, the new Yankee Stadium in 1923. A World Series home run. The World Series home run, excuse me, when the Giants played the Yankees there, yeah. Right. It was a great and, moment in Casey's life because he was already considered an old man, and it didn't help that he was running the bases, yelling out loud to himself, Go, Casey, go, Casey, go, Casey, (laughs) as all the infielders heard him as he was chugging around the bases. Now, he had had a foot injury a few weeks earlier, and a little bit of a rubber cushion had been inserted into his shoe. Um, As he was running the bases, the cushion popped out. Casey didn't look down, but somehow he thought he had lost the shoe. So he slid home. And he said to Hank Gowdy, the on-deck hitter, I think I lost my shoe. And Gowdy <laughs> looked down and said to Casey, well, how many were you wearing, Casey? Because <laughs> we still had two on. <laughs> that's, that, that's funny. You know, and, and then we see Casey doing specifically, which is very important, because he knew with the championship with the uh, Oakland, uh, I forget the name, the Locks or something, Oakland, um, and that's where he starts getting noticed by the New York Yankees. Um, now, he did spend really his whole career in the National League, um, but he had always had a friendship with George Weiss, who later became the general manager of the Yankees. So he and Weiss always kept in touch. In case, remember, there were only 16 teams then. And a fact that a lot of people don't realize is that when there were 16 teams, the three New York teams, Brooklyn, the Giants, and the Yankees, were often all at home at the same time. Um, You couldn't avoid it. That was the schedule. When those teams were home at the same time, that puts six of the 16 major league teams in New York City at the same time. And they were all day games. So that these players from the six teams would congregate together in the evenings at New York night spots, Jack Dempsey's restaurant, whatever. And they would all really know each other. So even if you played in the National League, as Casey did, or managed there, you knew the Yankees people, and you knew uh, the visiting American League team people. So George Weiss knew Casey well, had a long-standing friendship with him. Casey managed Oakland to the Little World Series Championship in 1948, which was the minor, leagues world cha- minor league championship. And the whole baseball world took notice of this kind of long-forgotten character named Casey Stengel. So when the Yankee job became open in 49, George Weiss shocked the baseball world by hiring Casey. And Casey was, you know, Casey wasn't going to, uh, he was thinking of of retiring, I believe, at the time. He could have retired happily. He was 59, or he could have continued managing Oakland. Um, Now, remember also, when there were 16 teams, the top AAA teams, particularly in the Pacific Coast League, were really the equivalent of major league teams today. It was, um, it was, you know, like the next 14 best minor league teams, you could say, were the equivalent of major league today when we have 30 teams. So Casey winning in Oakland made him very popular there. 
He and Edna lived in Southern California, so it was a short trip home, and it was also a place they were at frequently when they would play Los Angeles or Hollywood or San Diego. Uh, so the combination gave him a good life out there. Um, but Casey couldn't resist this offer to come to New York and manage because he wanted to show people that he really was a good major league manager, despite all his last place and seventh place finishes when he managed Boston and Brooklyn. Now let me ask you this, Molly. When he came to the Yankees that year, and uh, I think um, I think you used uh, David Halberstam's um, Summer of '49 as a uh, as a source. Um, Casey found that he had to platoon because everyone was getting injured, including DiMaggio. Yes, he had over 70 injuries that year that he had to deal with. So it was probably his toughest season as a manager. He was forced to platoon simply because of all the injuries. He'd lost to Maggio for three months. He rarely ever had what was intended to be his regular lineup in there at the same time. Nevertheless, he prevailed, won the world championship by beating Brooklyn in the World Series, and his ticket to Cooperstown was on the way to being punched because he won four more after that to give him five world championships. Let me ask you something. When uh, Bucky Harris managed the Yankees a year before, and um, the, the whole 48 season is, is also an amazing season between the Yankees, Red Sox, and Indians, did he have as much problems with the guys from Joe McCarthy's era like, like uh, Casey did? No, not really. I think Harris came in with more credibility and more of a solid reputation as a manager, having been to the World Series with Washington. Um, I think he had more respect. He had less respect, though, from the front office because, for whatever reason, Harris only wanted to manage while he was in the dugout and in this manager's office. When the game was over, so was Harris, and he refused to give his phone number to George Weiss. Weiss was furious about this, and when Harris failed to return to the World Series in 48, that was it. Bucky was gone. And uh, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, I even remember watching WPIX way, way uh, back in the late 70s. He had a Zuto. And both uh, him and Dimash are not very fond of Casey. It was true that the players who played under McCarthy and Stengel preferred McCarthy, and the players who played under Stengel and Hauk preferred Ralph Hauk. So Casey was not one for winning popularity contests with the players. He was all business, and he was, uh, he was prepared to show them who was boss, but uh, when it came time to cashing those World Series checks, the players didn't have many complaints. Now, let me ask you this, Marty. Again, we have the clown, Casey, and then we have the serious manager in the dugout. Did he have that kind of Jekyll and Hyde persona where he can turn it on to the press, but yet be so serious in the dugout with his players? That's exactly right. The players themselves seldom saw the clownish Casey. That was Casey with the writers. That was Casey doing TV appearances. That was Casey mingling with the fans. Um, he was a comical guy, and he had a, a winning personality like that. But he was all business as a player manager. He was all business talking to his players. Um, and he was all business in terms of the business of the game, transactions and things like that best exemplified by the trade of Billy Martin in 1957, if you wanted to talk about that. Sure, go ahead. Well, Martin was always Casey's boy. It even says that on his plaque in Monument Park in Yankee Stadium. Um, he played for Casey in Oakland in 1948 when they won the championship. And then he came up and joined Casey and the Yankees, and Casey was got so much out of Billy Martin. I think even to this day, I've never seen a player play so far above his natural ability 
as Billy Martin did when he wore the Yankee uniform. It was a remarkable thing to behold. Anyway, as close as Casey and Billy were, by 1957, the Yankees got into a fracas at the Copacabana nightclub, and Billy knew he was doomed. And sure enough, a few weeks later, the Yankees traded him to Kansas City. Well, Billy was terribly hurt by this and was never the same player again, and didn't speak to Casey for some 20 years because he was so hurt that Casey didn't stand up for him and stop the trade. And later in his life, people would ask Casey about this, and Casey would say, well, tell Billy Martin to grow up. This is the profession he chose. People get traded every day. Uh, stop whining about it. It's uh, He makes too much of the situation. So to Casey, this was the prof- baseball was the profession. This stuff happens, and he didn't feel any sentimentality about trading some popular player that he had mentored. And you know something, Marty? A lot of people remember Billy, like myself in the 70s, of being a very volatile character, especially with the umpires. But people forget, um, before uh, Billy Martin, there was Casey Stengel and there was Leo DeRocha. And now both of these guys didn't like each other either. Strong personalities at work, that's really what you can say, and you mix it with the competitive factor, the fact that DeRocher and Stengel were never on the same team together. They were always opponents, sometimes direct opponents, but always opponents in the days before the players' union. Opponent meant opponent. There was really very little fraternization other than what I had cited earlier about how they might meet in the evenings at New York City night spots after all the day games had been completed. Um but certainly very strong personalities at force there. Why was the press so important uh, to Casey Stengel? He used to say to others, learn the names of the writers, don't worry about the players. (laughs) Um, First of all, he enjoyed the give and take because the writers were not very – how shall we say it, not very hostile, not very uh, threatening. They were kind of all in this together. They traveled with the team. They played cards with the players. Everybody knew each other. It was like one big traveling family. Casey enjoyed their company, particularly late into the night at the hotel bars, sitting on the bar stools, telling baseball stories. He had a captive audience there. The writers loved it. They loved knowing this guy who was born in 1890 and had all these stories. So it was a wonderful relationship there, which, when he went to the Mets, even got better because his job by the time he got to the Mets was to woo the writers, to make them love the franchise, and to divert attention away from how bad the Mets were going to be. Let me ask you this. I want you to demystify Stengelism, what it was and why Casey employed it. Stengelese? Yep, Stengelese. Okay, well, he probably always talked a little bit like it. The definition of it would be a kind of run-on double talk that um, he used to either avoid questions to stall for time while he was thinking of the answer or to just uh, amuse and confound the listeners. Later in his life, when he would be like a banquet speaker, he would just pour it on knowing that's what the audience came to hear. When the New York Times asked him to write an op-ed early in those op-ed days, they wanted Stengelese and they got it. When he testified famously in Congress before the Kefauver Commission in 1958, he told his life story in one run-on sentence, which was done in Stengelese, and it was on all the newsreels in theaters for weeks, and his reputation as this double talker was kind of made. Um, you combine Stengelese with Yogi Berra being on the team and contributing yogiisms, and you had a jewel of, a, of information coming forth to the writer's hands 
which they just adored having. It was a beautiful part of Americana. You know, I, I wish I was alive at that time to see both Yogi and uh, Casey, uh, you know, talking to the press. Because you don't know what the hell either one of them just said. But that it was like well, it was um, the uh, the president of the Knicks, Phil Jackson, the great NBA coach lives on my block, and somebody had told me that he was a big Casey Stengel fan, which was news to me. So I talked to Phil about Casey, and he said, oh, yeah, there were times when I was coaching Chicago or Los Angeles that I'd give them an answer without giving them an answer, <laughs> and I'd say to myself, <laughs> well, that was a little bit of Stengelese I just gave them. <laughs> <laughs> now let me ask you this: you, you wrote a piece a few years ago, um, you know, and it's very important to you, I think, because um, you wrote "Was Casey Stengel a Racist?" and you published it two years ago uh, on September second, uh, twenty fifteen. Jackie Robinson uh, always accused um, Casey of being uh, racist, whereas Ellie, How uh, Ellie uh, Howard denies that. I know it's complicated. But uh, what's your take on this? It's complicated because the question of racism is the most complicated subject we have as a nation. We've always had it, and we always will, apparently. Uh, and it's often in the eyes of the beholder. I tend to think Casey comes out okay in the end on the issue, but in a full discussion of it, there's a lot of on this hand and on the other hand, Jackie Robinson thought he was a racist because he thought the Yankee organization was racist. And when pressed, Casey would defend the organization, not surprisingly, the people that were paying his salary. And he would say things like, well, Jackie Robinson is chock full of nuts, the coffee company that Jackie worked yep. for. Um, Arlene and Elson Howard thought Casey was not at all racist, and they loved the guy in case he loved dancing with Arlene at the World Series celebrations. Um, here's the bottom line on it. Casey created a very welcoming environment uh, for Elston Howard when he joined the team in 1955. There were no incidents in the clubhouse, in the dugout, on the field. Everything went very smoothly for Elston Howard in his transition to the major leagues as the first African-American Yankee. Casey's coaches, Jim Turner from Tennessee, Bill Dickey from Little Rock, Arkansas, could have been in an earlier time uh, opponents of integrating the team based on their upbringing. Casey himself went to segregate city, but he was uh, he was fine with Elston Howard, largely because Ellie was such a good player and largely because Casey just wanted the best players. He saw the Dodgers had Robinson. He saw the Giants had Mays. And it was, where's mine? I got to compete. I want some of them, too. So uh, on that sense, Casey comes out okay as far as I was concerned. Let me ask you this, Marty. A few, let's step back a few years to 1946. Uh, and uh, Jackie was going into the minor leagues. Um, he could have, and I don't know if it was common knowledge now, uh, not back then. I do know Lee McFam, uh, wrote a memo to all the American League, uh, owners not to integrate, uh, with Negro League baseball, uh, that they would not be up to standards. Uh, I don't know if Jackie got wind of that or whatever, but what was that sentiment amongst the American League owners that they would not do that? You know, we would have had to have been there. Um, it sounds inexcusable today. And, you know, by today's standards, it certainly was. And it should have been by the standards of the time. But we weren't there. We're all too young now to remember that. Um, probably in the 70s, when I was working for the Yankees, people in baseball felt the same about Japanese players. Like, well, I remember them saying, like, you can't bring any Japanese players here because at best they're like AAA players. They really can't contend, compete in the major leagues. I don't think that was a racist comment so much as a commentary from scouts having seen Japanese baseball 
and from American teams having taken tours there and beaten the Japanese pretty regularly. So it was a different time. It was a, you have to put it in context. It certainly sounds terrible today, but um, we weren't there. And so, you know, I don't know if we would have stood in line with everybody else and saying, well, they can't, we don't think they can compete at this level because their league isn't as good as our league. Um, that might have been thinking that would have influenced us. Now, let me ask you this. Howard Cosell pops up and talk about what happened there. Well, we're jumping ahead to the Mets here, but it goes back to his Yankee days when Cosell first mm-hmm. appeared on the scene with a reel-to-reel tape recorder looking to do interviews for WABC Radio in New York, and nobody would talk to him. And finally, Bob Fischel, the Yankees' PR guy, prevailed upon Casey and some of the players to please talk to Howard. Casey did, and that was uh, broke the ice, but, Kate, but Cosell was never an admirer of Stengel. Um, and then when the Mets started in 62 and Casey was there, the writers all loved Casey. They all respected what he was really there to do, to provide entertainment value and divert attention away from the team. Cosell alone just didn't get Casey. Or if he did, he was smarter than anybody else. But he was calling for Casey to be replaced even in year one. Uh, he just thought, this clown is never taking the Mets anywhere. He's just there for laughs, and the Mets fans deserve better. So he was all over getting rid of Casey right from the start, and either he wasn't in on the joke and didn't get it, or he was smarter than everybody else and saw that this was a diversion away from the, what needed to be the Mets' business of getting better. Let me ask you this, uh, Marty. In 1960, the Yankees lose a heartbreaking World Series. I think they had the Pirates on like 56 to about 18 runs, but it goes seven games. He's setting his age. But now let me ask you this. If Casey would have won that World Series, would Yankee management have gotten rid of him? The answer at the time was yes, they would have, because it was about retirement policy, not about success on the field. The reality, we'll never know. I kind of think they wouldn't have uh, fired him. But he was getting older. He was 70. And the Yankees had a manager in waiting named Ralph Houck, who would actually win pennants in 61, 62, and 63. They didn't want to lose Ralph Houck. They knew he was going to be a gem of a manager. So were they going to wait until Casey was 71 or 72? Or were they going to pull the trigger right then so that they didn't lose Houck, who was being pursued by both Boston and Detroit? The answer is they went for it so they wouldn't lose Houck, and I think that was the main reason. But it was certainly a terrible public relations decision that they made. Now, let me ask you this. Now we have 61, the Mets are coming up, and uh, why does Casey want to take on a brand-new ball uh, club, uh, and he's going back to his, uh, you know, stomping grounds at the polo fields? Yeah, polo well, fields. He, he, he kind of looked forward to returning to the polo grounds, which was being reopened after the Giants left after 1957. Uh, he did it partly as a favor to George Weiss, who was now the president of the Mets and who prevailed upon Casey to come back. But also, I think he saw the opportunity to stick it to the Yankees in whatever way he could. He was bitter about the way he was handled there and the way he was fired after 1960. He passed up opportunities to manage the expansion Angels in 61, the San Francisco Giants, same time, Alvin Dark got the job. Um, but the Mets just sounded enticing and appealing to him, a chance to eat into Yankee attendance and annoy the Yankees <laughs> by being and, back and most, in the New York sports scene. Now, of course, you know, he had probably probably the worst team ever, 40 and 100 and uh, 122 uh, losses. Um, but let me ask you, do you think Casey – enjoyed managing the Mets. 
Well, it was a whole different experience for him. I mean, on the one sense, managing a bad team was old news for Casey. He'd done that already in Brooklyn and Boston. But on the other hand, uh, he was no longer the same manager that he had been with the Yankees just two years earlier. With the Yankees, even at age 70, he was fully engaged. His mind was encyclopedic. He would remember how this guy did against this pitcher back in April. Uh, he was pushing all the right buttons and was fully engaged. By the time he went to the Mets in 62, he knew he was there for entertainment. He really let his coaches, Cookie Lavagetto and Solly Hemis, run the team in terms of making the lineup and handling the pitching rotation. And amazingly, he let a center fielder, the all-star Richie Ashburn, he let him run the games on the field, the positioning of the players, the engagement with the umpires. Richie was kind of the manager without the fans having the slightest clue to that. And Casey would be known to nod off in the dugout and catch a few winks while the game was going on and was not really as engaged, not nearly as engaged, as he had been with the Yankees. And what strikes me is this, though. I understand that for five years, from 57 to 62, all the Dodger fans and all the Giants fans were mourning the loss uh, that their teams moved west. But do you think the Yankee management, the way they handled Casey and eventually Yogi Berra, and all this other stuff contributed to more people coming out to Met games and Yankee games in the mid-60s? Well, I've thought about that. Um, I think that the fan base is unique and separate. I mean, even when the Yankees had New York all to themselves from 58 to 61, their attendance did not really increase with the absence of the Dodgers and Giants. They were unable to lure Dodger and Giant fans to the to Yankee Stadium. Uh, when the Mets were born, their big success at the gate was largely due to the return of the Dodgers and the Giants. If you take those returns out of that first year, the Mets only averaged 9,000 fans a game for the other National League teams. So it was still very much a Dodger-Giant versus Yankee split in the city. And uh, I don't think that there was ever going to be National League fans embracing the Yankees or grudgingly going to Yankee Stadium to see games. Let me ask you this, Marty. He um, he had to retire in '65. I think he must have his head, and that was it. But that's just starting to get quality players. Shaver, uh, you know, and then uh, Bart Williams uh, came in. Do you think? If Casey was the manager in 1969, instead of Gil Hodges, he's going to be as Paul from the Orioles? Well, we know from his first years with the Mets that he was no longer really engaged. So I would have to say it wasn't going to happen in 69 under a situation where the coaches were actually running the games. Um, the Mets needed a new manager after Casey broke his hip, so they were kind of lucky in the sense that the timetable speeded up. Uh, I'm not sure Wes Westrom was the answer or that he was going to take them to the promised land, but Hodges clearly was a big change from Casey Stengel, and I don't think the Mets win in 69 if Casey was still there. And uh, let me ask you this. Um, we know in 1970... The Yankees invited him back, I think, for old timers' day. Um, and he still was better. Uh, ten years after the fact that the Yankees gave up on him, do you think that Casey came to a resolution, at least in his mind, uh, Aaron Hudson, when he told Bill Martin, said, hey, this is our business, you know, that this is the way it's going to be? The irony of Casey's exile from the Yankees and his eventual return in 1970 was that the Yankees did to Casey exactly what big, what good business in baseball dictates. And when I say that, this is what I mean. The Yankees retired Casey so that they could go younger with Ralph Houck and not lose Houck. Well, just the year before, the Yankees had traded Hank Bauer 
an aging Hank Bauer to Kansas City in exchange for a young Roger Maris, who would prove to be a terrific acquisition. Um, Casey had no objection to that. He knew good business when he saw it. But kind of the same thing happened to him a year later, and, you know, he was outraged by it and didn't return to Yankee Stadium for an old-timers day for 10 years. So the irony was apparently lost on Casey when it was personal. Now, we know that Edna got sick in the 1970s. She begins to have Alzheimer's disease, which affected uh, uh, Casey severely. Um, but he still got all the baseball, and he still got all this ladder, and he still... Do you think he was more of a Mets fan or a Yankee fan than the time of his passing? Absolutely more of a Mets fan. And when he got fan mail, which he still got in great quantity, he would always write, let's go Mets, on the, on the autograph. Uh, he would send, if people didn't send something for him to sign, he had little picture discs of him that said, let's go Mets, with a picture of him in his Mets uniform that he would use. He wore Mets underwear, which Edna was always getting on him for. <laughs> he found it uncomfortable. <laughs> but, um, but he was definitely a Mets fan till the end. And let me ask you this question. And then I'm going to ask you a question. Is there anything to wrap up the show? Why does much of it need to be? I'm, I'm not hearing you. Okay. Do you hear me? Did you uh, hear me now? Yes. All right. Yes. Um, do you think it was one of the Mets that made you use this wonderful picture of Casey uh, on the ball panel? The cover, you're asking about the cover photo? Yeah, I guess if you use the next one, I'm going to use the one. It's a Mets, it, the first thing is it's his wrinkled old baseball looking face, winking, it's a fabulous picture. It's a Mets cap, but we, Casey was more than the Mets. He was the Yankees, he was the Dodgers, he was the, Do- he was the Giants. He was the great ambassador for baseball. And we didn't want people to think that somehow this was a Mets book or even a Yankees book. So we cropped the photo so that the cap is, is you can't see the logo on the cap, which was the right call because this is for all baseball fans and this covers his whole career, which had so many stops in it. Let me ask you this, Monty. Did I forget anything that you might want to tell the listeners? I'd just like to say his the last four chapters deals with his life in retirement, and what a wonderful thing it was to just be Casey Stengel in retirement. He lived a great life. He was devoted to Edna when she had Alzheimer's, or what we now know to be Alzheimer's, and was put in assisted living. Even when they took Casey's driver's license away, he would walk two miles to her care facility every day to visit her, even though she didn't know who he was. It was a great love story, and his devotion to her was very important. At the same time, his commitment to be an ambassador for baseball was there throughout the rest of his life. He hardly ever missed Cooperstown. He hardly ever turned down a banquet. He went to everybody's old-timers days. Uh, and everybody just loved the presence of this guy, born in 1890, who broke into pro baseball in 1910, still being relevant and still being on the scene. And I think that was a wonderful thing. Besides Amazon and Barnes and & Nobles and Borders, where can we find your book? Well, I always encourage people to patronize the local independent bookstores, which I think are great, and I hope they thrive forever. Um, you could get the full description of the book uh, at Amazon.com. And uh, I, th- I found in doing this that most people under 40 were not familiar with even Casey's name. But I think if you're a baseball fan, this is a guy you really need to become familiar with because he was such a joy and such a delight for 55 years of professional baseball. Plus, his legacy lived on, you know, uh, through Billy Martin, because he was a Casey's boy, and I'm sure that Billy employed some of the uh, things that Casey uh, 
taught him when he was under his wing. And a lot of the managers have to do what Casey did uh, today. It's true, although there are really no managers today that you could say are direct descendants of McGraw, Stengel, and Martin. Uh, because everything is computerized and handed to them, to them today, it doesn't require this encyclopedic mind that remembers situations. And the other thing is Casey was at his best going out and arguing with the umpires, firing up his team, firing up the fan base. And that's a part of baseball that's gone now, too, through the use of replays to decide close calls. So a lot of what Casey succeeded in is gone from today's game. I guess Joe Madden with the Cubs is the closest we have to Casey now, just in terms of being sort of a character, but still is a huge difference between Joe Madden and Casey Stengel. And the only other thing I have to add is it's paradoxical that Joe Torrey would come in, um, a failed manager like, uh, you know, Casey was in the majors, and turn around a Yankee team whereby uh, Joe Torrey would win four out of the five, first five years as a Yankee manager, and Casey would win the first five years. Uh, and Casey came in with the reputation of being a clown, and Torrey came in not with that kind of a reputation, but the headline in the New York newspaper was Clueless Joe. Now, that was a reflection of his not getting, not knowing what he was getting himself into, not about his uh, clownishness or intelligence, but still, the deck seemed stacked against both of them, and yet within five years, they both had their ticket to Cooperstown punched. And it was a beautiful story. Hold the line for a second, Marty. Um, First of all, I want to apologize to not only you, but the, but the people listening for the breakups and the uh, uh, this doesn't get um, heard uh, by the uh, folks. It's just between you and me, unfortunately. But we're going to do our best. Folks, I, ha- I hope you had a great time. I had a great time with Marty. I hope you had a good time, Marty, although uh, a little inconvenient. But, um, uh, you know, go out, get Casey's thing, a very important thing. Uh, very important, but you'll learn a lot. It's baseball history at its best. I'm Ian Gahanna. It's in for Mark Weiss, who is nursing a broken arm, and for Marty Appel. And in the other words of Edwin Amaro, good night, folks. Good luck. We'll see you next time.